Hello and good evening to you. Welcome to Business Focus here on TV3. My name is Alfred Okansi and in the next 50-55 minutes we're going to be engaging on two major topics uh, tonight uh, which has indeed got a lot of people talking. The Bank of Ghana's decision to increase the uh, minimum capital requirements of the various commercial banks in the country. Some financial observers have reacted differently and there's been mixed reactions to this particular announcement. But we're going to do the analysis from both sides of the, those who are for it and those who are against it. There's a largely uh, the, the requirement to have it increased, but the quantum of increase is what has got a lot of people talking. We're going to be talking about that this evening as we go on tonight here on Business Focus. Also, the paperless port system has been in operation or was rolled out a little over a week after the vice president's directive. A number of issues have been raised by the major stakeholders in this paperless port system. We're going to be talking about that as well tonight here on Business Focus. You want to stay with us this evening as we engage on this. My name is Alfred Akansi. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to welcome you. But as always, as we start off with the wrap of the week, the major business stories that we brought to you. Hello and good evening to you. Welcome to Business Focus here on TV3. My name is Alfred Okansi and in the next 50-55 minutes we're going to be engaging on two major topics uh, tonight uh, which has indeed got a lot of people talking. The Bank of Ghana's decision to increase the minimum capital requirements of the various commercial banks in the country. Some financial observers have reacted differently and there's been mixed reactions to this particular announcement. But we're going to do the analysis from both sides of the, those who are for it and those who are against it. There's a largely uh, the, the requirement to have it increase, but the quantum of increase is what has got a lot of people talking. We're going to be talking about that this evening as we go on tonight here on Business Focus. Also, the paperless port system has been in operation or was rolled out a little over a week after the vice president's directive. A number of issues have been raised by the major stakeholders in this paperless port system. We're going to be talking about that as well tonight here on Business Focus. You want to stay with us this evening as we engage on this. My name is Alfred Akansi. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to welcome you. But as always, as we start off with the wrap of the week, the major business stories that we brought to you.
process to go a little bit smooth today is monday we want to find out from you what are the plans ahead for the week the statistic we have from this morning shows that now confidence is building up and volumes are increasing for example between uh, the first and the today we've done about a uh, thousand and forty one declarations transactions for both takradi and tema these have been paid and we're at com compliance as of this morning when 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 we spoke around nine o'clock but quite a lot have been worked on but we are beginning to see that uh, volumes are increasing mm -hmm. saturday evening there was a whole a meeting we had a meeting with all the stakeholders the port authorities gra um terminal operators um with the Commissioner General and the Commissioner of Customs. And so that meeting was virtually for us to understand where we were. So that's the Deputy Commissioner in charge of Policy and Programs, Yauche Richard Patrick, uh, uh, in the Customs Division of Ghana Revenue Authority, speaking there. About 1,000 custom entries have passed through. And Kwekwache uh, Dako is still with us in studio. Now, confidence is building. That's the verdict of the Customs Division. Is that what the freight forwarders also see? Well, Alfred, I think. If the confidence is actually building as he seeks to, you know, portray, I don't think um, they would have come up with such an instruction, I think, late Friday, that um, officers should manually release all declarations, you know, on which duties are paid prior to the implementation of the 1st September uh, policy. Um, these were some of the concerns we raised before the implementation. These were some of the advices that we gave them that we think the way this thing was going to be implemented was, was too swift and that we needed time to pilot it. How much time did you need? I mean, because you, this indication was given the, 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 the indication came in actually May. And then mm -hmm. there was no noise. There was no education. There was no sensitization on this thing. There was then, no there education? Was nothing. And out of the blue, we hear, first September, come first September, we're going to implement the palace policy. Are and, you saying that? Yes. They did not engage the freight forwarders they on didn't. any front about how this process was going to roll there, out. There, there were some late seminars, about one, two or three, just in the, it, two weeks to the implementation. That was when some of us were even engaged because we all didn't even understand the whole thing. That was when some of us were taking through uh, one or two forums to understand what was actually coming. And that I can tell you, there wasn't much education on the ground as to what freight forwarders should be doing or importers should even do. Because let me tell you, this policy is about importers and the major stakeholders in this, in this policy are the freight forwarders because we actually use the system. So we're supposed to have been trained, we're supposed to have been you know, enlightened, talk to us about what to do and what not to do. When the vice president made a statement, I mean, there wasn't anything until somewhere 15, August, mm -hmm. we started hearing news that come first September, what the vice president said was actually going to be implemented. And we gave them these scenarios about what, you know, we anticipate, this chaos. But you know, you know what I wanted to do? Because that particular head of, I mean, we've moved on now. Sure. The process is being implemented. Yeah. It's now, been a little over a week now. Sure. What exactly are the problems that freight forwarders are still facing? The problem we are having now is that before 1st September, certain declarations have paid, you know, we have paid certain duties on certain declarations. And we were expecting that before 1st September, all declarations which have gone through the old system should have been allowed to be cleared through the old system. That was our For this process to run yeah, concurrently. I mean, that's what we suggested. We gave an advice that they cannot let everything go through the new system. But believe you me, after 1st September, all previous declarations, you send uh, an alert for, to Gapoha to, for, for, for an invoice, and then it goes through the new system. CCV, which have been processed and, and generated before first of all, we're all expecting those ones to also go through the old system, apparently also pass through the new system, creating mess-ups. So you are holding a document that was generated through the old system. You get to the examination, and the officer tells you he cannot find it on his front end. 
And that was a problem. Oh, so when, when these issues came up, I recall the Revenue Authority, indeed the various authorities of the port saying that they were going to clear the backlog. And that, is, they said, had been done. So, so where, where lies your, your, as I speak your concern? To you, well, as I speak to you, mm -hmm. today, before even this directive came from customs, there are still examinations who are saying that there is even one guy clearing a car at a car park. His declaration is going through a new system. The examination which says he's not having access to so the declaration. Access. access to the declaration that the gentleman is holding. How is that possible? I don't know. So he's stuck at Golden Jubilee. Car park Sabon now. We have people who had made payments since Wednesday and compliance have not gone through. And these are facts. As I sit here, message keep, keep coming on my phone. I can show them to you. So we are not just making the noise out of nothing. It's something that has happened on the ground. That is why we are talking. Well, when, you, when you bring up these concerns, what ex exactly is the reaction from the various authorities of the ports who are overseeing this people and system? I think the first time we raised this concern, um, we had a meeting with the Deputy Minister of Finance. I think he was there on this Friday. In fact, I personally spoke to him on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And he understood our predicament. And that we told him, we made it, we made it clear to him that, you see, when you waste one hour at the port, the shipping lines and other terminals, they laugh. Why? Because they're going to make money. When government has taken his revenue, and then the importer suffers, what happens? So we told him that for this, for this system to be able to work perfectly, one, we need to make sure there are too much, too many integrations in the system. Mm -hmm. Previously, what was happening was that you submit your document on the pass. You, you create your CV, you see it on the pass. And the CCVI is generated on the pass. After the CCVI has been generated, <coughs> it is pushed back to you on the GCMS, which is the GCNet platform. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you do everything on GCNet platform through clearance chain. Okay. With the current system, you do the first phase on the G on the on the pass system, like you, st you still create your UCR mm -hmm. on the GCMS system. Then you push it onto the pass. Then CCVR will be generated. Right. You go through your compliance after duty has been paid, but immediately you go through the shipping line, and then you send an alert from your office to the terminal that you are ready to pick your cargo. It sends you automat automatically from the GCNR platform into another platform called GMS. Which is a West Blue platform. I see. So after after the Friday meeting, what was the resolution in addressing this? I, I want us to round up. What, what, what happened was that I'm told on, even on, on Sunday they, they called all custom officers to come back to the port and clear the backlog. But as to whether they've been able to clear all the backlog, we are yet to find out. How many who said it was a clear sabotage on your part because you were benefiting from the system at, as was existing? How does a faithful that be, become a saboteur in the system? I am, I am a service provider. I'm providing service and you are giving me tools to, to use. So how do I use, uh, how do I sabotage the system? My brother, how, I mean, I don't know the, the kind of role a faithful that can play in saboteering or, or in sabotaging the system. I, I don't know. Because we are not managers of the system. We are not the implementers of the system. We only use the system the way it's been given to us. And that is what we are using. Have, are we, are, are we, aren't we been paying duties? We've been paying duties. We've been going through compliance. And we don't do compliance. We don't do vetting or document. It is not a faithful order. That's that verification, classification, and valuation. All these things are made up by custom. So mine is to wait at my end and then wait for a response. That will come from custom. And then, then I, I make the next move. We're going to be engaging with you a lot more as the days roll out on this particular issue, you know, because after Friday there was a resolution that you should go back and clear it. We're going to monitor it to see what happens. We're stakeholders in this, but I'm grateful for your time as always. Can I, can I just pass one? M maybe very quickly. Okay. Yes. I think I just, you just, about what you just said on there in front of, you know, daily yes. traffic that free forwarders are the saboteurs in this system. I, I just want to say that, um, it's very unfortunate, like I just told you, mm -hmm. the kind of role I can play right. to sabotage a system when government want to make my job very easy for me to do. How do I turn myself and sabotage the same system that's going to, you know, get 
my daily bread. I just don't understand. And I think the journalist or reporter, whoever wrote this, you know, story, need to be schooled. If she, he or she doesn't understand the system and the processes we go through in working at the port, it's better he comes to us. We take him or her through the system. And then he will understand that a faith what does not actually even have anything to do but with what, what, what goes on, you know, at customs. Thank you very much. Great evening. That's Kweko Chidakon. He's a technical uh, committee member of the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders. Let me just let you know, we're going to be focusing on what's going to be happening in the port in the coming days and bring you a lot more on this. Still live here on Business Focus. We'll be back shortly and we'll get into the discussion on the new cap minimum capital requirement for banks as announced by the Bank of Ghana, which has got a lot of you talking. We'll be back shortly to stay. Well, welcome back to Business Focus here on TV3. Now, some financial observers have been expressing mixed reactions to the Bank of Ghana's announcement of the increase in the minimum capital requirement for commercial banks in the country from 120 million CDs to 400 million CDs. Something you expected? The quantum is what we're going to be discussing. I've been joined in the studio this evening by Dr. Lord Mesa. He is a senior lecturer at the Finance Department of the University of Ghana Business School. Doc, good evening to you. Good, good to have you. you. Also, Joe Jackson is a financial analyst and head of operations at Dalex Finance. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening. It's good to have you. Good to have you, too. Were you surprised by this announcement in terms of the quantum? Because from what I observe, there's a general expectation that there should have been an increase. But the quantum, was it something that you expected? Not really. Not really? Not at all. I, I, I wasn't surprised. Um, if you look at what has been happening to the sector over the last uh, few years, in, in 2008, there was an increase in dollar terms, mm -hmm. not just in uh, bringing the, uh, the figure up. There was a huge increase. In 2012, there was another increase. In fact, the 2008 increase was about 33% in dollar terms and another close to 40 plus percent in 2012. So we Absolutely. are not surprised that this yeah, has... This is 200, 200%. No, in CD terms. Okay. In dollar terms, it is not as much. When that figure was fixed at 120, mm -hmm. right? Right. It was less than two CDs to a dollar. We're now absolute four point five. five. So about. even to bring it into, uh, if you do a, 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 the dollar term analysis, then it would not have too much of a. Thank you, because after all, our CD has suffered significant depreciation in that time period since twenty twelve, right. and so. Part of this is representing the, 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 the loss in real value of the amount quoted. And part of it also represents a trend that has st started in 2008, that the Bank of Ghana, the central bank, has been increasing the minimum reserve uh, amount, uh, the, 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 the capital, capital requirement. Capital requirement. Mm -hmm. It's been putting it up in dollar terms each time it changed it because the economy is getting a lot more sophisticated, right? So yeah. you need bigger shock absorbers to withstand what is happening. So it wasn't a surprise. In fact, some of us were afraid that it could go as high as five. As a matter of fact, I had, I had people, I mean, the likes of you, predicting 500 million. Yes. And, and so the 400 others, there were figures earlier in the morning, 320, 350, 400, until there was that official announcement by, 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 by the Bank of Ghana. But you do a historical analysis of this, and that's why I bring you in, Doc. Because in 2008, it was increased by 700% in CD terms, uh -huh. from 60 million CDs to, for, that's about, from 7 million to 60 million CDs. That was in 2008. Yes. In 2012, subsequently, Commercial banks were expected to recapitalize to 120 million CDs from 60 million CDs. Mm -hmm. That is in CD analysis. So this new figure of 400 million CDs, 
represents about 233 percentage point increase from the 120 million CDs okay. that was the case. Doc. Right. If you look at um, the increment and the inconsistencies in it. Inconsistencies? Yes. You realize that from 700 percent, you know, percent increment somewhere in 2008, then now you're talking about 20, 233 percent. Now, you can see clearly that the inconsistency itself poses a risk, depending on where you sit. What exactly do you right. mean by that? What I mean by that is that risk management is about looking into the future. Sure. Now, looking at capital requirement, it takes care of only one component of risk. But if you take banking, banking has several risk components. Okay? That is why the capital requirement, you know, as part of the risk, you know, that risk management techniques is not able to you know, sense early signals as far as, you know, exposures are concerned. So if you look at the dynamics, the system has been in such a way that we've moved from, you know, capital requirement to a point where we need to look at, you know, um, risk management at the operational level. Because if you're able to capture the risk at the operational level, before it will eat gradually into the capital of the bank. Let's take, for instance, when a bank is crumbled with, you know, governance issues. A bank is crumbled with, you know, unprofessionals at the banking floor. These are operational risk issues. But the moment you start concentrating too much on capital risk and looking at the, the kind of percentages that we increase, you know, our capital requirement, it tells you that we've not found that threshold that we can keep you know, our financial system or the banking sector for the next maybe 10 years without any adjustment in the capital requirement. We know very well that banking is becoming sophisticated. Now, banking has moved into technology. Banking has moved into you know, things that you know, can easily break down the banking system, which you know, dominate our financial system. So I presume that you know, the central bank should be quick as much as possible to implement all the accords that you know the Basel Committee proposed mm -hmm. in terms of bank management. Mm -hmm. So, possibly there was a Basel one which we are on now, and then yeah. the Basel two which you want to exactly, to to and move then into. Basel three. You know, but it's because the Basel three is able to sense signals early. Because if something is messing up, you have to catch it up by the operational level. You understand? Okay. So the Basel two and three are there to complement the capital requirement. But then my, you know, take is that the over-reliance on capital requirement might not necessarily solve banking problems in this country. So we need to look beyond capital requirement. You might think, oh, some capitals are not well, some banks are not well capitalized. Mm -hmm. That is why you think possibly increasing the capital requirement will bring out those that are not what, you know, and then possibly they will be shot out of what, the system. But I believe that banking and then diverse banks that we have in this country might have their channels that they operate. Some banks will be focusing on SMEs. Okay, I get the Some point. Banks, I think you're, you're, you're raising the issue about the business modules that the banks run because that's one of the criticisms against the wholesale um, yeah, ex increase exactly. of the minimum capital requirement. So Across board. And, and that was one of the questions that was, was asked. So if you have banks operating different modules, some focusing on SME, some focusing on consumer banking, investment banking, merchant banking, should they all have the same minimum capital requirement? You see, here's the, here's the catch. You go for a universal banking license that allows you to do everything. If you decide to differentiate yourself today, we still have to impose all the restrictions on you because you don't have to change your license and your capital requirements to change what you're doing. So the, 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 the challenge is this. This is for universal banks. And back to the point that uh, 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 he was making. I agree. This is just but one tool in the arsenal of making sure banks are properly run and that they don't put their depositors' money at risk yes. and they don't wait till 
shareholders, especially those who are uh, go public, they don't wait till the shareholders funds away. But it is an important tool. Oh yeah, it is a really important tool. And if you look at the trend in 20, uh, 2008, the amount of uh, the, the, the it was forty eight million dollars. In twenty twelve, it rose to sixty three million dollars. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's risen to about $90 million. Mm -hmm. I will dare suggest that until we've reached $100 million, I doubt whether any of these institutions can go to bed thinking that we, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 they, are, they are adequately capitalized. Today, it's $90 million. Mm -hmm. I say in a few years, especially in what has been uh, uh, bringing the erratic nature of the increase has been the depreciation True. of the CD. True. If you look at it, it has actually been consistently around 30 to 40 percent increment each time we go in dollar terms. So I will say that I agree with you in the sense that we've got to have a, a, a holistic view of this issue. But this is an important tool. And weak institutions, smaller institutions, put the entire banking system at risk. How, how much of this is a threat to indigenous banks? You know, because the expectation is that you would have banks consider a lot more measures, um, you know, to to be able to meet this requirement, to be able to strengthen their capital base. But that also means that it's going to threaten uh, indigenous banks because you have predicted foreign banks. Yes. taking over local banks yes. that this happens. Because if you look at where we find our economy now, it's, 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 it's an economy where the local front is more or less struggling. So if you pick the banking space and then you raise the bar, trust me, you're going to have foreign banks calling their parent banks, you know, looking at the returns that they can make in this country for them to add in. But then where would the local banks go? They have no choice than to fall on, you know, and then make sure that they come together. So we're going to see serious measures, you know, taking place within the next uh, four months. That, but is, uh, that, is that not good for, 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 for our economy? Is that not good, yes, good for the banking not, sector let's, 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 as we have it now, yes, with the let, problems let, that we're facing? Let's not forget with. that, you know, in our financial system, the banking sector dominates. And in the end, you cannot afford as a country to have the foreign banks dominating your economy. Trust me, there's a serious problem. One of them that I foresee will be pressures on our exchange rate. In a sense that when a foreign bank has to return to their parent company, trust me, they don't need CDs. They're going to return dollars. So in the, in the next, you know, the, the aftermath of all this, raising the bar, and in the end, you having your economy dominated by foreign bank, you can't afford to control the CD against the dollar. Now, let's also look at government policies. Now, policies are more or less effectively aligned with local banks. If the government want to, you know, implement any policy, I presume through the local bank channel, it will be effective because local banks have, you know, in terms of spread, in terms of representation across the country, I mean, they have the branch outreach, okay? So in the end, I'm, 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 I'm saying that we should be careful, you know, how we raise the bar. That is why I stressed on the fact that that won't be the only risk measure that we need to look at. We need to look at other risk measures. It could be that it will be a smaller bank, but at the end of the day, that bank can operate to ensure that the government policy goes through effect. You know what, since we talk about government policies, all the major indicators or influences of interest rates have been declining. Local banks haven't responded to, to, to give credit at any cheaper rate to, to, to the private sector in this country. So, <laughs> Dr. Mesa, I mean, that's also an offshoot to this. But how, how much of a threat is this, um, this particular requirement to indigenous banks? I, I like what you ask, how much of a threat? I tell you this, the bigger threat is from those small Badly run, weak, with huge MPLs, undercapitalized. Yeah, actually, what caused the MPLs? It, it's institutions that we have. 
In any case, some of us feel that if the bank, if the, the, the sorry, if the government was, had less institutions to call on it to assist, even those NPLs won't come. So even the argument that we need banks to align the government has me worried. The central bank, will, uh, the, the, the government will come and say, give us a loan to subsidize free will. Otherwise, the economy will come to grinding to a halt. And then leave us with huge energy sector debt. But now we're going to have to raise a bond to settle. Half the problems, if you take away the energy sector debt, half the institutions will be in much better health than, or maybe even uh, 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 three quarters of the institution will be much better health than they are now. So the biggest risk we all face is that these institutions we have, 30 something institutions, now supposedly 39, who are small, who are badly run, <laughs> who are uh, uh, undercapitalized, <coughs> and, uh, uh, and who have huge NPLs. That is a huge risk to the whole system. <laughs> and so, as much as I, I'm Ghanaian, I come from a very Ghanaian institution, I would love to have Ghanaians uh, dominate the sector. But I'm also realized that there will be no sector left if we allow the current situation to persist. Let me just remind you, so have your business focus. I'm going to do this very quickly because there's one person who is not very happy about this. He's a, a, an owner of an indigenous bank. I'm talking about Dr. Papa Kusindum. Uh, beyond him being a politician, he is the president of Group Indum that owns an indigenous bank in this country. And he's been expressing his thoughts about this minimum requirement by the Bank of Ghana. Banks are set up for different reasons, for different purposes. There are some banks that want to do big, big, big ticket items. They want to be able to finance, uh, for example, oil exploration. Oil exploration requires uh, quite a lot of money. And you can't do it if your capital is small. So there are banks who want to do big, 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 big transactions. There are some banks in Ghana who want to be the ones who finance cocoa purchases for Cocoa Board, for example. If you want to do that, you need a lot of money to be able to do something like that. And then there are banks who want to do small things. They want to be able to fund a cocoa seller. They want to be able to fund a farmer who is doing not subsistence level farming, but decent level farming, uh, or might want to fund maybe a rice mill or something like that. That doesn't require millions and millions and millions and millions uh, of, of dollars of something. So they had banks that, that have different purposes, different goals. So to lump all the banks together, and say that everybody must meet a certain minimum, okay, without regard to the, 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 their business objectives or their goals or their business plan. For me, um, it is not right for a system such as what we have here in Ghana. There are some of the biggest banks that you may find, they are not found all over the country. And many of them are consolidating, and they want to consolidate. They want to be in the richer areas of Ghana. And to be able to fund uh, oil and gas, you don't need to be all over Ghana. You just need to be in a few places. So if somebody has a business plan that says, I want to do the big transactions, I want to deal with big multinational companies, and so on and so forth. Um, their business plan will show how much money they need in order to be in that sort of banking business. And then, if we're saying, what is the capital adequacy uh, amount that we need, then that can be calculated based on the amount of business they want to do or the size of transactions they want to engage in. Now, there is an effort to force the shrinkage the shrinkage of banks in Ghana, 
Uh, many people say, well, we're, we're less than 30 million people, but we have more than 20 banks. And so we have too many banks. Well, why? Um, not all banks are equal. Not all banks want to do the same kinds of things. And so they look at Nigeria and say, Nigeria has many more people than Ghana. Since they have fewer banks, then we should also force the minimum capital that, that is required so that some who may not be able to meet that requirement would get together with other people. So you force them together. Dr. Papakosindum, he is the president of Groupindum uh, that also owns an indigenous bank talking about this. And he makes the point about size of transactions differing from one bank to the other. And so that wholesale uh, requirement is going to be a problem because, for example, of presence. I mean, those who may be able to meet this requirement will not have that priority of being present at certain areas in this country. And we're talking about increasing the banking population in Ghana. Doc. Sorry, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> you know, it's my response to this is simple. There are already different categories of licenses hmm. that have different capital requirements. If you want to do smaller size transactions, please get a savings and loan. That does not allow you to do all the fancy big transactions, but also has a much smaller uh, 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 capital requirement, so that the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the facilities exist as we speak for institutions with smaller requirement, capital requirements to downgrade. But if you go for a universal uh, banking license that allows you to do run the whole spectrum, forgive me, you want to play with the big boys, you have to do big boy things. If you want to play with the small, small, why, why is it that our institution, I come from an institution, we're a finance house. We're not a bank, and we don't plan to be a bank anytime soon. We, 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 we are playing in our league, and we are very local. If we decide to become a bank, forgive me, we will go have to go and raise 400 million. And I agree with that amount. You do agree. Doc, the, the finance minister speaks the language of looking out for fewer but stronger local banks. And it appears this minimum capital requirement is, is going to help in achieving that. Hmm. It's worth. But then my question is, some banks being local and being small will be able to meet this requirement. And the question you need to ask yourself is, recapitalizing. Where would they get the money from to recapitalize? It could be a bad debt accumulated. How will you know? You understand? Mm. So we need to be careful how we raise the bar. Now, I'm saying this because when you call in for recapitalization, more or less, you're forcing the banks to look for money. Where? Is it in this country? Now that the system is down on its knees in terms of economic activities everywhere. So where would they get the money from? They will be forced to recapitalize as a result of true other means, which we are, if we don't take care, we'll end up having illegal, you know, banks, you know, standing and we think it's their banks. You understand? So for me, I presume that if it is risk that we actually, you know, trying to control in this country, then we shouldn't look at only the capital requirement as a tool, you know, for, you know, ensuring that the bank stays you know, afloat. The regulator should go beyond just that. Yes. I mean, but then, 33 to about 35 commercial banks for population of Universal banks. Universal <laughs> banks yes, yes, for yes, population of yes. so. And we still have a little over 60% of the total population unbanked. Then that flies in the face of the argument that why should we even have many more banks? With the system? issue of no. banking and then bringing people on board to be banked, I would say it's a policy that goes beyond the banks themselves. The government needs to take that. If the bank, the government understands being part as a player, you know, in the financial system, because it should be a policy that will be rolled out, that will encourage, you know, holding an account even at a local level, 
ensuring that microfinance are regulated the way they come up and the way they operate. Right. Yes, very, very important in this, in this case. Mr. Jackson, two things. One comment, one first comment. One thing I liked about the Bank of Ghana announcement was that it was very specific in the categories of capital that could be used to increase the, the, the uh, minimum requirements. Okay. That's number one. Number two is this. There's another way of looking at how many people are still underserved or uh, excluded from our banking system. That you have 30-something institutions all competing in the golden triangle. True. Accra, Kumasi, Takrabi. And they are just, there's so much competition, it's almost negative. Right? What we need is to prune these institutions down so that the Bank of Ghana can vet them better and create new categories of institutions or better utilize the existing categories so that we can truly improve those who are underserved or not served at all. Fantastic. And in the coming months, we're going to see what happens. There's been predictions of mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> Thank you. Joe uh, Jackson is a financial analyst, head of operations at Daylight Finance. Dr. Lord Mesa is a senior lecturer at the Finance Department of the University of Ghana. Business School, the gentleman this evening. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I'll be back shortly after this quick break. We'll do some stock analysis here on Business Focus to stay. Welcome back to Business Focus. Uh, Justice Edu is a research analyst and, and uh, with uh, First Bank. He joins us in the It's good to have you. How's, how's the stock market looking and how are the stocks performing now? Um, generally, the stock market has done very well this year. But over the past week, we saw some stocks, especially the financial stocks, driving down the market. Specifically, you're looking at Stanchart. Stanchart has gained significantly this year. But we are seeing some sell-off in Stanchart shares. And that led to a drop in the financial service index as well as the composite index as well. And aside from Stanchart, we've seen some downward pressure on price on GCB and on Enterprise as well. So cumulatively, these three financial service firms have led to a dip in the, in the composite index and the financial services index, even though generally the market has been good this year for stocks. Fantastic. Let's go on to the commodities market now. Uh, the major commodities we're looking at, gold, cocoa, um, oil, coffee, how are they performing? The highlight there is gold. Gold has done extremely well this year, and over the past couple of weeks, the price has actually strengthened because the dollar has weakened. And if you look at global investors, they are not anticipating the U.S. Federal Reserve to increase interest rates. And if it remains the way it is, you expect gold prices to do well because when interest rates are not rising, people tend to invest more in gold because it's a safer investment. For crude, we've seen the price trend up over the past couple of weeks mainly because of the hurricane situation in the U.S. Yeah, so we are not spared of Hurricane Emma? No, not that. It's, it's actually a threat to the current low price we are seeing in, in, in crude oil. And from a Ghana perspective, if you're looking at the fact that gradually we are becoming net exporters of crude instead of net importers, it should be good news if you're able to lock in on high prices now. The issue is that because of the fact that production has been affected by the hurricane, there's less supply onto the market and because there's less supply it tends to affect the price so prices are trading just around the 53 dollar per barrel margin about a month ago it was around 51 dollars so you can see there's some appreciation there which should be good for people who have been clamoring for an upward adjustment over the past couple of couple of months with respect to cocoa um, things are not looking too okay. good even though over the past couple of weeks things right. have improved slightly Thank you. I'm grateful for Thank this. You. And uh, we're going to continue a lot more of this. And now, Justice Aidu is a research analyst who is first bank. Grateful, Justice, always, for uh, joining us. On behalf of the team, we're grateful. And thank you for joining us here on Business Focus. My name is Alfred Okanse. And stay with TV3. Good evening. <laughs>